A very good afternoon to you all. The session we are going to have now is called When All Is Said, where we'll have Ms. Nayantara Sekal and Ms. Ritu Menon in conversation with Mr. Sunil Sethi. Ms. Nayantara Sekal has written nine novels and eight works of nonfiction. She is the recipient of the Sinclair Prize for Fiction, the Sahitya Academy Award, and the Commonwealth Writers' Prize. A member of the Sahitya Academy's Advisory Board for English, till she resigned during the emergency, she served on the jury of the Commonwealth Writers' Prize in 1990 and 1991. She has held fellowships in the United States at the Buntington Institute, the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, and the National Humanities Center. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Science and was awarded an honorary doctorate in literature by the University of Leeds in 1997. She is associated with the founding of the People's Union for Civil Liberties and served as its vice president during the 1980s. Ms. Ritu Menon is the co-founder of Kali for Women, India's first feminist press and, founded, and founder of Women Unlimited and associate of Kali for Women. A co-author of Borders and Boundaries, Women in India's Partition, she has edited No Women's Land, Women from Pakistan, India, and Bangladesh write about the partition of India. Also, recently published or Educating Muslim Girls, a comparison of five cities and unequal citizens, a study of Muslim women in India, both co-authored, and in a minority essays on Muslim women in India, co-edited. She is also co-authored From Mathura to Manorama, Resisting Violence Against Women in India. Journalist, columnist, and television presenter, Mr. Sunil Sethi has hosted the weekly literary show Chess Books on NDTV since early 2005. He was one of the founding editorial team of India Today, has worked for the, has worked for the Hindustan Times, and been a columnist for the Times of India and the Indian Express. His journalism has appeared in The Economist, The Boston Globe, and several international publications. He has scripted and presented documentaries for the BBC and Channel 4. Now I leave the stage to the panel. Enjoy the session. Thank you. I know. Good afternoon. Can you, can you hear me clearly? That's great. Uh, it's a fantastic uh, pleasure and a privilege to talk about a very remarkable biography today by, uh, by the editor and um, uh, biographer Ritu Menon of the distinguished uh, novelist and political activist Nayantara Segal. The book is called Out of Line a political and literary biography. Uh, we have a tradition in this country of biographies of major public figures being largely written as holy hagiographies, uh, admiring, flattering, uh, and rather hidden portraits uh, as if uh, biographers or indeed uh, autobiographers uh, uh, go into a kind of congratulatory and even self-congratulatory mode uh, of regarding these personages as uh, superheroes or heroines, gladiators as it were. What's remarkable about uh, Ritu Menon's biography is that uh, it unfolds uh, the life of Nantara Segal, a member of the Nehru Gandhi family, a witness to uh, the early years of uh, independence and uh, the nationalist struggle for independence, uh, and later uh, a, a remarkable writer of both nonfiction, uh, uh, a defender of civil li liberties and, and democratic freedoms, and of course, a very well known uh, novelist. Uh, the biography opens on four levels a political history of uh, the last days of the uh, struggle for independence and uh, the founding of the nation state by her revered, adored uncle Jawaharlal Nehru and her mother Vijay Lakshmi Pandit. It's family history too of the Nehru Gandhi family uh, of which she's a member and a very close observer. Uh, it's personal history of her own struggle uh, to find a voice 
and also to come out of a uh, long, difficult marriage, uh, a difficult divorce, and uh, to forge new relationships and uh, carve her literary career. Finally, it's a very fine literary biography where Nayantara's le- uh, uh, opinions, her life uh, in, in, on the public stage are beautifully inter- interleaved with a critique of her writings, both fiction and non-fiction. Ritu, I'm going to start with you. Uh, did you choose Nayantara Segal as a subject or she chose you as a biographer? No, I, she certainly didn't choose me as a biographer. And, you know, um, maybe uh, there's something to that as well, but we can talk about that later. Um, no, I, I thought that she's a subject that uh, she and what she represents and continues to represent um, is one of probably one of the rare subjects that one can find in our uh, in our literary constellation. I'm speaking, of course, only of writing in English. I don't read many other languages, so I dare not speak about those. But I thought that this was a very important uh, enterprise and an important project for all the reasons that you mentioned in in your introduction, but also for two or three other very, uh, I think, very significant. Uh, facts of her life and of her writing, which is, of course, that she's one of the few writers who has written in practically every genre of writing, except perhaps poetry and, uh, and plays and, and children's books. So whether it's fiction or nonfiction, letters or political columns, she was the first, polit- the first woman political columnist uh, in the country. Can they hear you? Yes, I'm, I'm audible, yes. Um, and she has continued to be politically engaged in an extremely, um, I, I want to use the word with, uh, repeatedly, with the kind of integrity that is very rare, uh, generally, and that is extremely rare in writers. Now, here is a writer who's uh, whose uh, largest oeuvre is novels, is fiction, but the political thread that runs through all her writing has remained strong and consistent. This is a very extraordinary and remarkable fact, and as, as you know, Sunil, and as she has always said, her main character has always been India, has been the country. Not, not the geographical uh, entity, but what she has called the glittering aspiration of India. Now, this makes for a very unusual person. This makes for a very unusual project. And the literary and the personal and the political, whether in her writing or in her life, have actually been indivisible. There is a way by which I feel her life, personal or familial, can't be understood without the political. The political can't be understood without the familial or the literary. And the literary cannot be read without reference to the political and the personal. So in a a way, if I might just just sort of add one line to that, uh, the way to all of this for me became the, the path through her fiction. So the spine of the biography is actually her writing. That is what forms the axis on which everything else is then then constructed, if you like. Nantara, my question to you. Uh, What was it like for you? What was your instinctive reaction when Ritu Menon approached you? You've been very assiduous in maintaining a very extensive personal archive uh, throughout your life. Thousands and thousands of letters, documents, manuscripts, photographs. But what was your response uh, to lay all of it, your inner life as well as your public life, open to somebody? Well, first of all, I said to Ritu, why do you want to write about me? 
who's going to be interested in reading about me? I had never written. She had asked me many times if I wanted to write an autobiography. I had said no. And then she said, well, in that case, could she do a biography? So I said, if you want to, but what's the point? <laughs> who, who would be interested in me and why? But she decided to go ahead. And the only way to go ahead, well, both in her view and mine, was to make my papers available to her. After that, I did not uh, have anything more to do with her project. I never saw it in manuscript. And to this day, I haven't read the book uh, as a whole. It's her project. It's her biography. And um, she has made what she thought should be made out of it. And that's fine with me. Why haven't you read it? Well, um, the joint release of her book and mine was to take place on the 31st of July in Delhi. I live in Dehradun. Up till two days before that, I hadn't even received a copy of the book. I had never seen it in manuscript. Finally, when it came to me, I was leaving for Delhi. I had an opportunity only to glance through it. And after the launch, when I came home again, I got busy with my new writing and some domestic and personal tragedies in my family and never had the leisure to sit down and go through it page by page. Ritu, uh, a biographer's task, it could be said, is made easier if one's writing uh, a posthumous biography. But here, you are dealing with a long life, a complex life, uh, political terms, in terms of a public uh, persona, uh, a life also beset by uh, personal difficulties and vicissitudes of the literary imagination as well. What were your difficulties? How were you so confident that you could construct a life of a living person with very alert, perceptive, critical faculties? Well, you know, one, uh, I mean, there were several sort of challenges, but I want to say one or two things uh, in response to this business of access to everything. Of course, it was, it's a gold mine. You know, there are projects or there are, there are attempts at writing sort of biographical stuff uh, with a scanty archive. In Nayantara's case, the problem was exactly the opposite. There was a huge archive. Not only was there a huge archive, but she's written everything herself. And about herself often. And about herself. Two autobiographies, a collection of letters, every political uh, uh, statement, comment, um, struggle, everything has been... And then, of course, the family is one of the most archived families in the country. So the problem was of having an enormous archive. Then, when you have access to personal papers, the responsibility it places on you is even greater, just as with a living subject, than if the subject was no longer around, and you didn't always have to be mindful of that responsibility. Now, in this very extensive personal archive is a lot of very sensitive material which means that the discretion that the biographer has to, has to exhibit is phenomenal. For me, the challenge was twofold. One, how could I unfold, as you said, a life which is already so well known? Who doesn't know Nayantara Segal? Who doesn't know Vijayalakshmi Pandit? Who doesn't know Indira Gandhi? Who doesn't know Jawaharlal Nehru? Who doesn't know Mahatma Gandhi? Who doesn't know what was happening in the country, and so on and so forth. How was it going to be possible for, for me to actually uncover some things and to make connections that weren't already evident? So as I, I said to myself that the image I used was that of a kaleidoscope, which is that the pieces remain the same, but each time you turn the kaleidoscope, they fall differently. 
And so you see different patterns. That was one. The second was, of course, that Nayantara is one of the rarest individuals in that she made no conditions. This is extremely precious. And as I say, it places an even greater responsibility on the writer. But she denied me no time. I spent hours talking to her. She denied me no scrap of paper. And she never asked to see the manuscript. I did send her a couple of chapters. And all she did was to make factual corrections. I was 20, not 21. The year was 1979, not 78. But there was never a question that she wanted to be represented in a particular way. It's an enormous responsibility. I wouldn't have that with a subject who was no longer alive. It's also something very remarkable and has to do with the uh, deep relationship, I think, of mutual trust between subject and biographer. That's for Nayantara to say that. Um, of course, there was that. Um, I had trust in this woman because of what she had stood for in the cause of women. Uh, many years ago, I had published a selection of letters between myself and my husband-to-be called Relationship, which I sent to her and her partner at that time in, in uh, publishing called Kali for Women. I didn't even think of sending it to a mainstream publisher because I felt that they, Kali for Women, stood for something. So in my mind, she was a woman who had stood for something and who would uh, be fine for me to go along with. Uh, and of course, we got to know each other a great deal better as her research and her writing proceeded and she came to know my family a good deal better than she'd ever known them. And she became one of us. Ritu, as you say, um, the early part of the book, the political history of the Nehru Gandhi family is... Please, please uh, Sunil, if I can connect, correct you on this point. There is no such thing as my belonging to anything called the Nehru Gandhi family. I am a descendant of the Nehru family because my mother was a Nehru. But the Gandhi family, which till recently ruled India, is the Feroz Gandhi family. It is Feroz Gandhi's family which has ruled India. So don't call, I know that the media does this all the time, Nehru Gandhi family, but this term has absolutely no meaning at all and it certainly doesn't apply to me. I only say this uh, because, because of the simple facts of history. Uh, your mother, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, not only was a deeply loved uh, sister, uh, but also uh, a great partner in the de Nehru's development of, of the new nation state yeah. and foreign policy, the first uh, Indian woman as ambassador to three uh, world capitals, uh, a later a governor, member of parliament. In fact, uh, she stood from Pulpur, which was Nehru's parliamentary seat after his death. And also, similarly, Nehru's daughter, Indira Gandhi, your first cousin. Uh, and you were very, very close as young women. So in that context, uh, I mean, you know, uh, you may know her as Indira Nehru, but the world does know her as Indira Gandhi. It is Nehru Gandhi. That's the correction but I want to make. she was Feroz Gandhi's wife. Right. <laughs> uh, nevertheless, uh, let's go into later political history because as Ritu beautifully delineates, the personal is political. Uh, there came a moment uh, in the, from the mid-1960s onward, uh, when Indira Gandhi became Prime Minister, the year was 1967, when the personal relationship between your mother and her niece uh, uh, began to falter, to founder, and 
cracks began to occur between Mrs. Pandit and Mrs. Gandhi. Uh, this became, in your case, overtly political as Indira Gandhi's authoritarian streak by the late 1960s and early 70s resulted in that dreadful episode that we call the emergency. You became, by then, your cousin's most trenchant and bitter critic. Was that really a kind of political baptism for you? Another baptism of a betrayal? Uh, it was a very traumatic uh, time for me because, uh, and at that time people said to me, Mrs. Gandhi is your family, how can you go against your family? And I said, I am in fact speaking for my family in defending the values of Jawaharlal Nehru it is she who is going against the family. She and I had been very close. Not, we had not grown up together. She was 10 years my senior and had not been living in Anand Bhavan at the time that I was growing up there. She was abroad in England, in Switzerland, and um, Europe. But she had been a very loving older cousin, and we had been very close. I could not find it possible to go along with her in what I saw as her authoritarian trend which began uh, in the early 1970s. And she could not take opposition, especially from her kith and kin. So this break came, and for me it was not a political baptism because I think I was politically baptized at birth by the fact that I was born into a family that was deeply into the political struggle. My father, in fact, died of his last imprisonment under British rule. So what it was for me was carrying on the ideals that I had been <clears throat> brought up to believe in. And it was traumatic because I had loved my cousin and she had loved me and we had shared a close relationship. So in this way, I was sort of torn apart. But I still felt I had to go ahead with my belief that she was doing what she shouldn't do by establishing, as she did later, a virtual dictatorship. Two stories come together here of a breakdown between two branches of the family, two cousins. Nan Tara Segal uh, opposes the emergency writes very fiercely argued anti-Indira columns week after week, throws her lot in with Jayaprakash Narayan, writes for uh, every man, and is in fact under threat. The title of the book, Out of Line, comes from that, doesn't it? Yes. She but, was so badly out of line with the powers. That's a story she should tell. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, that, uh, that phrase, out of line, I think uh, must have come from uh, the fact that I was writing against Indira Gandhi's policies at the time, and I was invited to dinner. This was just before the emergency, 1974, I think. I was invited to dinner by my brother-in-law, who was then a civil servant. And at that party, suddenly a man whom I didn't know came across the room to me and literally sort of attacked me, accosted me uh, by saying, if you do not stop writing the way you do, there will be consequences. So, um, I was very, very angry that anybody should uh, attack freedom of speech in that way. And uh, as I've said before, if I had not been wearing a, my best uh, beautiful pink Banarsi sari and gold high heel shoes, and if I had not been brought up in nonviolence, I would gladly have dislocated his jaw. That's what I 
wanted to do at that time. And he then quietly went away. And my brother-in-law said to me afterwards, you know, you shouldn't have spoken to him like that. He's very important in the establishment and you could come to harm. I said, I didn't care. I had to say what I had to say. Yes, but the threat was, don't get out of line. That's right. And of course, I did get out of line. But you know, it's more than just the political out of line. Actually, I, I thought when, um, when we published Relationship and in all those, uh, those years of great turmoil, that she had also stepped out of line in her role as um, submissive wife and accommodating uh, partner in the marriage. Now, you know, in, uh, uh, walking out of your marriage in the mid-60s was very, very difficult for, for a woman in India, especially a woman like Nayantara, very much in the public gaze. And in fact, when the talk about her leaving her husband or the fact that there was uh, trouble in the marriage became public, it actually raised a question in parliament. Now, that's not very common. I mean, if I wanted to walk out of my marriage tomorrow, I doubt that it would be a question in the Rajya Sabha. But in Nayantara's case, it did become a political question because of her mother, who was politically uh, uh, prominent at the time, but also because she was Nehru's niece. He hadn't yet passed away. Now, she was stepping out of line in her role, the conventional role of wife, accommodating wife. She was stepping out of role in her life as a political writer. And it has been her refusal to toe the line that actually, also in my view, marks her writing. Why do I say that? I say that because in English language, what used to be called Indian English writing, she is one of the first writers to, to focus on the urban middle class Indian. She is not romancing the rural. She is not valorizing the village. She is not speaking about exotic India. She is writing about the urban middle class, and she is one of the first writers to do that. So in a sense, she's slightly out of sync there as well. And this is what I think makes for this astonishing consistency in her work and her life, whether it's personal or literary or political. She is, I think, a very rare subject. I think it's remarkable, and the most dramatic, or one of the most dramatic pieces of this narrative uh, is how the personal and the political and the literary come together. The 1960s and the 70s were, of course, uh, tra very traumatic, as Nantara Segel says, uh, because of the breakup and the rift in the family. But for her personally, uh, it was the end of uh, a terribly miscast marriage and uh, a marriage that had gone consistently deteriorated into a great deal of emotional and even physical violence. And she had to get out and step out of line. Uh, those letters are extraordinary because by that time, she had gone out of line in another remarkable way. She had established a rela relationship uh, with the late and great Ian Mangatrai, a very distinguished uh, civil servant, and she left her husband to, in fact, openly live with him in what was known as in sin. These are very delicate matters, Ritu. They're delicate today for many women and uh, uh, were, had, as you say, huge consequences in the 60s and 70s. Did you feel a kind of vicarious thing of looking so deeply into a person's personal trauma of a disintegration of, of a marriage, of children, their custody, great financial distress. What was it like for you as a woman? Uh, if we hadn't published Relationship earlier, in which actually 
uh, a selection of those letters between 1964 and 1967 had already been published, uh, I, would have, I would have been much, much more affected by it. But there were days when I could not read those letters. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy to go through such, such intensely, deeply felt uh, writing. Emotion. Not just that. The letters are a wonderful record of a relationship as it, as it comes into being. They were also a wonderful record of their intellectual and political uh, sort of complementarity. I mean, they were discussing, Nayantarani and Mangatrai were discussing everything that was happening in the country. Kashmir was exploding. Sheikh Abdullah had just been released. Uh, the first India-Pakistan war had broken out. Uh, China had just happened. I mean, it was a politically very, very volatile. volatile period. They were discussing every bit of that in the letters, as well as, of course, what was happening in their personal lives. But as I said, there were days when I simply had to put the letters aside because it was not possible to absorb all of that. What was what made it possible to draw that line between vicarious uh, voyeurism and presenting something that was happening in her life that was very important for her writing and also for her, the articulation of her selfhood. We must not forget this. Nayantara Segal, I have said this in the book, Nayantara Segal's marriage broke down because she departed from the script that had been written for her. And in departing from that script, she finds her voice as a writer as well. There's a clear break in her writing pre-divorce and post-divorce. This is a very critical time for her. Now, you have to extrapolate all that from the correspondence, from the letters, and from the fiction. And it, it was difficult to know when to draw the line because if something in the letters was not relevant to the writing, I was not going to use it. There is a great deal in the letters that is of extremely sensitive nature. It's not part of my book and it should not have been part of the book in my view because it did not have a bearing on her writing. In as much as it had a bearing on her personal life, she had already written about it. It made it slightly easier for me. But also, of course, the fact that there's nothing speculative or scurrilous or scandalous in, in I think, the way that it has been presented. It is, of course, for the reader to, to decide. What's extraordinary about this uh, correspondence between Mangatrai and you is the sheer volume of... Maybe they fall in lust first before they fall in love. I don't know. But as a woman, I know about myself that I fell in love through my mind, through reaching a, a situation where there was a like-minded person with whom I could share not only my political views, but also my personal views. And um, who understood me because he had the same passion for the same ideas. Ideas, that's what we shared, long, long before we got down to anything else. So, several things are happening here in this amazing book, which unfolds, as I said, on, a, uh, on, on, on an account of political history, family history, deeply, deeply personal history of the breakdown of a marriage, a very embittered divorce, uh, and the flowering of a remarkable uh, new relationship uh, with uh, a lover and later husband. Uh, what's fascinating throughout this passage of the 70s uh, and for the next 30 years is that your writing, even though interrupted, never stops. But it takes turns, doesn't it? What did that dramatic political period and period of domestic and personal strife do to your writing? Um, well, 
Let me put it this way, that I see myself as having written, and in fact, going on writing between two terrible events. When I was a young girl, a devout Hindu murdered the greatest Hindu of our time. And I was there to see Mahatma Gandhi die. And a few years ago, I have seen devout Hindus take up the knife, the sword, the axe, the gun, to murder Muslims. And between these two horrifying events, I have seen a country come out of political bondage and be resurrected in charge of its own affairs, come under early governments which were highly idealistic, laid the foundations of what we stand on today, and how that high idealism drifted into corruption and decay. All of this is what my novels and even my nonfiction have been about. And yes, there have been twists and turns because my divorce left me impoverished. I had to find a living, which I couldn't do completely in fiction. I took to writing, and I think I was the only woman at the time doing so, writing political commentary for the newspapers here and abroad. And at that time, an article earned 250 rupees. So you can imagine that I wasn't earning a great deal. It was a struggle. And this struggle often prevented me from getting back to fiction, which was my first love. And then my one uh, big uh, foray into political activism was when I joined Jayaprakash Narayan in his Bihar movement. He invited me to write for him, which I did for his newspaper, Every Man's Weekly. And then I visited Bihar many times and did all I could to help him uh, in that movement, which again took me away for long periods from writing as I would like to have done. So in these ways, my writing life has been interrupted. But I've always got back to it. Ritu, uh, the question here is that, of course, a writer's life, uh, a writer's life is indivisible from her personal life. What's extraordinary about this book is that you are not only closely looking at Nantara Segel's life, but also her output as a writer, and you are critiquing both her novels and her nonfiction writing, which is actually emanating out of her life's experiences. Mm. Uh, how did this come together? Because there are different phases in a writer's life as well as her art. You know, I just, I wanted to say, wanted to make one clarification, which is, um, a biography is not a literary criticism. Uh, we often tend to, uh, to conflate the two. We think that a literary biography is a work of literary criticism. It is not. A biography must see the writer's work in relation to the writer's life. Now, this didn't used to be the case. Uh, there is a school of thought, till current till very recently, that you look at the writer's text, it doesn't matter what the life is like. All that has changed. Now you see the text, you see the context, and you see the life. Now, if I could do a very extensive literary critique of Nayantara's writing, but that is not the job of the biographer. I comment on the writing in as much as it emanates both from her life experience as well as her political convictions. That thread is very necessary. But I'm not going to give an opinion on her novels. I'm not going to say uh, this is a good or bad piece of writing. Because for that, I have another medium. I have academic criticism, which I can do very easily. But it's not my place as a biographer Right. to do that. But it is your place as a biographer to counterpoint. Indeed. Now, 
in, in a sense, what was very interesting for me was to see where the autobiographical element in the early novels uh, manifests itself in the subject of the novels, and then when that autobiography, when she withdraws from the text, she no longer has that obvious autobiographical element post the divorce. This to me was very interesting. I mean, how, how else was I to relate the life with the writing? You see, it's very, I think, it would have been much simpler for me to do a straightforward narrative of her life and a straightforward reconstruction of her, of her writing. It would have been very boring. It would have been bland because I would not have been making the connections. And as I said, here's a woman who has written everything already. There is actually very little a biographer can do except to see those, you know, it's pentimento. You, you have... You unpeel the layers. You have, a, you have a painting, you paint over it, and you see both the painting below and you see what's, what's painted over. It's pentimento. That's the only way I could, I could actually write her life. What also came to your great assistance was this extraordinary archive. Yeah. She hadn't, it seems, thrown away a scrap of paper, 6,000 letters Not between... Not even a thank you note. 6,000 letters alone between Ian Mangat Rai and her. Uh, uh, between her and her mother, her and Vijay her Lakshmi sisters, Pandit, her and her daughters. Jabarlal Nehru, I mean, so a whole half a century of the life of India and a woman's quest are remarkably dovetailed. I'm going to wind up this discussion now before we take a few questions by asking uh, Nantara Segal, uh, a, a person uh, associated with the high point, the high noon of Indian politics, uh, the ideals of Nehru, uh, Vijay Lakshmi Pandit, and uh, gradual deterioration uh, through the life of the lives of the ruling Gandhi family uh, till their recent and bitter defeat. How has India changed? How has public life changed? Indeed, a woman's life. Well, that's uh, asking a lot of questions. Asking her to write a book? <laughs> yes. <laughs> she has written on the subject, but I, in brief. I have written a lot on, on, on these political matters. Obviously, change takes place in any country. Um, Are you disappointed <clears throat> at today's uh, India? <clears throat> no. Uh, let me put it this way, that what is most important about a building it's the foundations. Anything that goes wrong with an upper story can be remade, repaired, redesigned. But the foundation has to be strong in order for the building to stay intact. Those foundations were laid in Nehru's time by the governments led by Nehru. And by that I mean the foundation of democracy which in India today is non-negotiable. No political party will settle for a dictatorship today. That foundation was laid then. Well, let us take the example of our new prime minister, Mr. Modi. He has risen from humble origins. Now, that, I think, is a great tribute to the foundation of democracy laid at independence and the social mobility that rose out of it. So we have a situation in India which in all fundamentals we can be exceedingly proud of and where we stand out amongst all the countries of Asia. Yes, there has been corruption. Yes, there has been decay as there is in human life apart from politics. And, well, if there hadn't been all this corruption, how could I have written all the novels I've written? Because that's, that's what they've been about. The 
<clears throat> downfall from high idealism into corrupt ways. So all of that is part of a nation's life. I don't think it should lead to disappointment. Personally, I'm an optimist, not in the short term, because I see a great deal of disturbing developments happening now, but in the long term, we have sound foundations and we have every reason to believe in them. Let me put this question more, political question more plainly. Uh, you see Narendra Modi's rise uh, in terms of great social mobility, which is true. And as you know, the uh, general election was fought by him uh, on the uh, campaign rubric of Chaiwala versus Shahzada. The Shahzada and his mother are also your kinsmen and kinswomen. Quickly, what do you think of Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi, indeed the Congress party, a political party that you and your family has been so closely associated with? First of all, I would separate those three things. Congress party, Sonia Gandhi, Rahul Gandhi. In most, people, in most people's mind, they, they are, are the indivisible. Same. Yeah, but I would like to say that they are very divisible. The Congress party is a great historic organization led under Mahatma Gandhi. It united this country, the regions, the languages, the literatures, the genders, under one great umbrella. And that is what India stood for. That is the idea of India that the Congress set forward and which we should cherish to this day. That is the Congress. Now, the Congress has been let down as it proceeded, first by Indira Gandhi, by denying democracy and uh, installing a dictatorship, and by establishing dynastic succession, which had nothing to do with Nehru, <clears throat> who didn't even appoint a successor. And it had nothing to do with the Congress party, which believed in tiers of responsibility from the ground up not from command from the top down, which Indira Gandhi established. As far as Sonia Gandhi is concerned, she was a young woman out of a foreign country who came here and married an Indian, and he happened to belong to a, a leading political family. Well, a family no, firm. No, it was not a firm. I, I disagree with that. It then, it became, started to become a firm when Indira Gandhi insisted on pushing Sanjay Gandhi as her successor, and when he died before his time, she then pushed Rajiv Gandhi into the role. This was anti-Congress and anti-democratic. Then, when Sonia Gandhi got pushed into this role, in the sense that it took her seven years to make up her mind after Rajiv's death, to come forward, and then she came forward at the request of her party to become a public person, which she had never been. I have to commend her for the hard work she did for the party. Here's an Italian woman who spoke no Hindi. She learned it. She got up on the public platform and read out speeches which were written in Roman English, uh, Hindi written in Roman English so that she could read it read it out in, the, in those days, early days, in a very stilted accent, which many people laughed at. But she did it. And she learned better and better Hindi until she was at home in it. She went from north to south, east and west of India. She became known in the rural areas, in the urban areas. This was her work. I don't think Manmohan Singh has traveled as much in India as Sonia Gandhi did. She got to know the country, and the country got to know her and to respect her for the fact that she did her homework. She was working at it, and under her, the Congress had two big revivals. Rahul Gandhi is not to be associated with her in any respect. A, because he keeps saying he doesn't want to be in politics. B, because he doesn't have the ability to be in politics, which is proven. And everybody knows it. And the best thing the Congress could do 
to revive its great tradition is to get back to its democratic roots, to say we will now elect our own leaders, we have no truck with dynastic succession. Unhappily, the rest of India is full of dynastic succession now, but the Congress should certainly get rid of it. That's... That's how candid, insightful, and forceful Nantara Segal's voice is, and how remarkably it comes through in this assiduously researched and beautifully written biography by uh, Ritu Menon. We'll take a few questions now for both the biographer and the subject. Uh, I've read the book. Congratulations, uh, Ritu Menon, on a very complex uh, uh, book. And Ms. Segal, uh, what comes through is your involvement in politics, in the writing of fiction, and in fighting a personal battle uh, on many different fronts. And uh, it comes through in the book that it uh, was a very difficult time. Uh, what I want to ask is, how did you summon the energy to fight so many battles at the same time? Well, uh, let me say that the, the upbringing I had, which was a, a passionate devotion to certain values, a passionate devotion to certain ideals, I remember, I don't remember because I wasn't there at the time, but Motilal Nehru, my grandfather, had made a fortune. And when he joined Mahatma Gandhi, as early as the 1920s, he said to Gandhiji, who wanted Motilal Nehru to join uh, the struggle, he said, let me stay outside because I can then support you financially. And Gandhiji said to him, it's you I want, not your money. So Nehru, uh, Motila Nehru left uh, the life of wealth and prestige to sleep on uh, a jail floor and so on. And the family followed suit uh, for all the years until independence. Those are the values that I was brought up with and which I still have. Yeah. And what more do you need to give you energy? You know, I just want to add that, uh, as always, Nayantara is really modest about her own, uh, I don't know what word to use, but her own courage. She is an extraordinarily disciplined woman. And she has always said that her writing was her refuge. But if it hadn't been for the discipline, that refuge would have been much more elusive than it was. Another question? Blue Sari. She's going to come with me. All right. Hi, um, my question is to Nayantara Sagar. Can't hear you. Hello. Yes. Uh, my better. question is to Nayantara uh, Saigal. What does she actually think of the biography? What does she think of the, bio your bi the biography? She hasn't read it. I haven't read it. <laughs> you, you missed, the, you missed the, the, beginning. the beginning of the show. I never saw the manuscript, and I never had time to read the biography. I've only glanced through it briefly. Which, in fact, is an act of courage and bravery. Uh, yes, there's a lady in the blue sari there. Can we send the mic over? Thank you. I salute to you, madam, for the values enshrined by your family. And also, I have gone through your articles and everything. But uh, my question is, what is the difference between the women of your era and girls of today? Because you have struggled to uh, enrich and... Uh, Go, went on continuing the maintenance of values and as well a good writer. So I want your personal opinion about women of today compared to women of your era. 
let me just uh, begin by saying that I think uh, the revolution in women's lives, uh, the liberation of women in a sense, was started by Mahatma Gandhi when he invited them to join the struggle for freedom and march shoulder to shoulder with the men, go to jail, suffer all the, the indignities and uh, hardships that that entailed. And women came out in their thousands and thousands during the 1930 movement when the Salt March took place. Now, I think that laid the foundation of what today we call women's liberation, and it was possible because the struggle was nonviolent. Now, after that, as we have all seen, women have gradually occupied every possible role in Indian life, be it in academics, be it in business, be it in any profession, women are making a mark in this country and I have the greatest admiration for what they are achieving. I think they've done it against great odds. And even if they haven't, even if they've done it with the support of their families, it is something which no other country can compare with in Asia, even abroad. I think America is far behind us in this respect. They haven't even produced a woman president to this date. So, uh, I, what I think of Indian women is that they're great. I think they're showing great courage. I think they're still battling huge odds. There is still that iron ceiling beyond which women can't rise, but they're going to overcome that. There's nothing to stop them now. Any more questions? Yeah. Uh, we'll take the final question now. Yeah. Yes. The lady in front, can we, this is the last question. Can we give her the mic? She's been waiting.